so the the project was um it's it's a part of my phd which i'm doing here in the department of zoology at the university of oxford um and olga was formerly here um as a postdoc researcher in the uh, Department of Computer Science here in Oxford. So we started working together and then she moved over to the University of Bath. Um, so I'm really on the on the zoology side. I'm working with the Wildlife Conservation Research Unit and Olga's um, the machine learning technical expert. Um, so what we've done is we've used very high resolution satellite imagery and deep learning to detect African elephants. Um, and so the project was carried out in collaboration with um, my two PhD supervisors. One is Professor David McDonald, who's here at the University of Oxford, and then Tijan Wang, who's at the Geospatial Unit um, at the University of Twente, and then uh, Stephen Rees, who was um, working with Olga in the Department of Machine Learning here. Um, okay, so I'm just going to give kind of a, a broad context. I'm sure most of you are aware of this, hopefully, <laughs> um, that at the moment we are in the sixth mass extinction. So we're losing species at a very rapid rate. Um, and we're obviously the, the biggest driving force of change on the planet is, is human presence um, and, you know, increasingly um, livestock um, uh, it, collection in different places, as particularly in sub-Saharan African countries, uh, the human presence is um, increasing quite rapidly, and this is obstructing uh, movement of, of different wildlife. So, um, and also the, the rates of decline, so to know how many species we have, we have to obviously count species, and there's multiple methods that we use to, to conduct population counts, um, so that we can really monitor these longitudinal trends and find causes of decline to then put effective conservation programs into place. Um, so what I wanted to do is I wanted to see whether it would be possible to use very high resolution satellite imagery um, to monitor elephants, because there's been um, several studies that have used satellite imagery to monitor wildlife previously. Um, but there's kind of specific things about those studies that um, allowed uh, the animals to be seen. Um, and so elephants kind of present a new quite challenging case study of um, a species that moves between habitats um, and it hadn't been tested whether we could actually do a census survey using satellites for African elephants. Um, so I'll just take you through some of the existing studies that already use satellites to monitor wildlife and then explain what we did um, methodologically to um, try to use satellites to monitor elephants. So um, the ex existing studies um, mainly have monitored wildlife in kind of very open homogenous landscapes, uh, particularly in Arctic environments um, and also uh, seascapes. Um, and then there's multiple studies that have used kind of an environmental proxy um, to, to show that there is uh, wildlife uh, present. Um, and uh, then the difference between kind of aggregations and individual detection. So um, here is an example of in Arctic environments, um, they have been able to detect um, penguins, uh, colonies of penguins using the guana stain, which is uh, the poop stain of the penguins against the ice. Um, and then that gives a kind of approximate um, size of colony um, and also just a presence absence. So the uh, image that you're seeing in the far left, that's from emperor penguins. Um, and so this was actually a really interesting study because it was it was the first study to use satellite imagery to do a kind of a global census of a, a species, in this case, the emperor penguin. Um, and they found four new colonies and they also were able to confirm the presence of three suspected colonies. Um, it's also been done for the Adelie penguins. Um, and uh, the study on the far right is in uh, Kazakhstan where they looked at mounds and were able to see the presence of marmots. Um, and then a few other studies um, have shown that it's possible to use satellite imagery to monitor whales when they come to the service uh, to the surface for breeding. Um, this was a study on the far left in Mexico where you can see the grey whales. Um, and then um, the southern right whale has been studied in Argentina. Um, and so obviously these are the world's largest marine mammals. So you, you still need high resolution imagery, but it, they are quite visible um, on the resulting images. Um, so then you've got a, a study here which has looked at albatross, which is possible to do because the spectral contrast of the albatross compared to, you know, their nesting site is quite strong, so you can see them just as white dots, and so then it's possible to do an individual count. Um, and the study uh, at the bottom here is of a polar bear, 
um, and that's just using the panchromatic band. So that's just the the black and white band, and you can you can see it pretty clearly there as well. Um, so there's a group working out of the University of Cambridge who have led quite a few of the studies on whales, um, and I know that Noah are also working on using satellite counts for whales. But you, yeah, the sea state, the changing sea state can be an issue. Um, and then also you're only able to monitor them at certain times of the year when they come, you know, up to the surface when they're breeding. Um, and then, yeah, aggregations are really um, the easiest uh, kind of grouping. It's quite difficult to identify individuals because we're limited by the spatial resolution of the satellite sensors still. Um, but when you've got an aggregation, then you can, you can see, you know, presence, absence, a, a precise count is not um, totally realistic for a lot of species at this point. Um, but you've got uh, an example here of Weddell seals that was done in Antarctica, um, and then uh, musk oxen in Canada, um, and also flamingos. This was quite an interesting one in India, um, which you can see they use the quick bird satellite uh, in just the panchromatic band. So you can see the white, uh, the white dots in the in the bottom left hand corner. Um, so the benefits in terms of wildlife surveying is that you can obviously cover very large areas um, and you can also cover cross-border areas without requiring, you know, civil uh, aviation permissions, um, which in some countries, so in the Kaza region in sub-Saharan Africa, where you've got Botswana, Angola, Zambia, Zimbabwe, and Namibia kind of all meeting in the middle and you've got a lot of elephant populations that are moving across borders. Um, this is quite. A, this is a great technique to be able to take one snapshot of that very vast area without requiring what can be quite kind of laborious and um, difficult to attain uh, civil aviation permissions to do aerial census surveys. Um, you can also do repeat surveys in quite short intervals if you're able to to put a tasking through. Um, it's obviously an unobstructive technique because you don't have any human presence on the ground, so you're not disturbing the animals in any way. Um, and it just overcomes the logistical challenges that, you know, a part of setting up camera trapping surveys or um, organising to do manned aircraft surveys and so on. Um, so the benefits are, are multiple. Um, the methods is, I think the methods is still a part that needs to be worked on to really make this more of a viable technique for more species. So the majority of studies have used like multiple observers just to cross validate counts of the species in the imagery across images, but obviously that's quite unfeasible for, for very large areas because the images are very big. Um, so you need multiple people to sit there for multiple days at a time going through and then counting and then cross validating the count between them. Um, and then what, what's been used often is taking a snapshot of an area um, and then taking another one, say, a few weeks later, and then comparing just to make sure that what you're seeing is not a rock um, or a crevice or something, and it is actually the species to so just check that the object's moved, um, which is obviously something that you will be familiar with from kind of uh, deforestation studies or land cover change, um, and also to look at fire and droughts and floods, um, this kind of uh, short time image differencing technique. Um, and then some of the obstacles that are like just inherent in the method is, you know, cloud cover. Um, also the cost of satellite imagery of the high resolution imagery is quite prohibitive, especially when you want to, you know, work with conservation agencies who tend to have quite limited budgets to, to put taskings through. Um, and also competition on the satellite as well. So this is something that Olga and I experienced um, when we put a tasking through to capture an image in Mali. Uh, and we got blocked because there was a uh, high cloud cover one time and then the second time there was somebody else had put a tasking request in um, and so we weren't able to get the image there. Um, uh, but that depends obviously on uh, how much money you have to pay for the for the tasking and also you know which agency you're working with so how high in the competition rank of the tasking does your request go in. Um, and changing sea states is obviously uh, going to be an obstacle for, for all the marine mammal monitoring. Um, so in our case study, we wanted to see whether we could use the high resolution satellite imagery to monitor elephants. Um, and these are savannah elephants. Um, and so we chose a site in South Africa, uh, Addo Elephant Park, which is the third largest national park in South Africa. And it, it kind of provided a great case study site because it's got very homogenous parts of the park and also quite heterogeneous areas. So you can see um, image one, that's a very homogenous 
uh, site, they're all close to the waterhole and you can count them quite easily. And then in the second image, they're more blended in because it's uh, quite forested. Um, so yeah, to see whether we could count them across different kinds of sites um, and add oh, these different heterogeneous homogeneous areas are quite close to each other. Um, and you also have quite a high concentration in quite a small area. And there happen to be, for some reason, still unbeknown to me, quite a lot of satellite images available for this specific area. Um, so what we then did um, is downloaded 11 images from the Worldview 3 and 4 satellite that covered both of these um, areas of the park in from different seasons and different years. Um, and we then pan sharpened the images. So probably most of you are familiar with what that is, using the black and white bands, which have a, a higher spatial resolution, um, and then using the color of the uh, red, green, blue bands to, to sharpen that. So then we have a color image at 31 centimeter resolution. We then use this um, label image tool, um, and I went through all of the images and drew these little boxes around where the elephants were. So we had 11 images, and across those images, we had just over a 1,000 elephant labels. Um, and then um, Olga used the TensorFlow Object Detection API to then build a model to automate the detection. Um, and then to compare how well the CNN performed, we then gave a portion of the label data set to 51 volunteers and asked them to label the elephants and then took the medium of that to compare with how the CNN performed. Um, and so for that, we used a um, image annotation tool that was developed um, here in Oxford, which is just a, it's a very simple online portal where they can see the images and then they just draw the boxes around um, where the elephants are. So that's uh, from the satellite image side and kind of laying out what it was that we uh, tried to do. And now I'll hand over to Olga, um, who will take you through the, the deep learning side. Okay, thank you. Uh, yeah, so from the technical side, uh, uh, what it was, so we uh, took all these uh, images uh, that uh, I'll uh, uh, tirelessly uh, labeled uh, and uh, we feed, uh, feed it uh, to the uh, faster region uh, convolutional neural network. Uh, I think you're familiar with that, uh, but uh, just a couple of uh, notes uh, what it does. So this is the neural uh, network architecture that is uh, presented with an image and output the bounding boxes around all the objects that we are interested in and also classify each of the bounding box which class uh, this bounding box belongs to. And it's uh, doing it in uh, two stages, uh, but in uh, one uh, coherent uh, architecture which has uh, two uh, branches so you, we first start uh, with uh, convolutional layers uh, such that we extract uh, features uh, from the uh, input image then uh, we uh, fit uh, these uh, feature maps uh, to a separate branch uh, which is called region proposal and uh, it roughly uh, creates uh, the bounding boxes uh, in this image uh, where an object can be so it's not necessarily very uh, highly accurate uh, proposals, uh, but at least uh, we cover, we should cover uh, all the areas that uh, can contain uh, objects. So, and then uh, we feed the, uh, this region proposals back with uh, feature maps uh, and uh, we refine the bounding boxes and also uh, finally classify whether this bounding box uh, contain a, an object and uh, uh, if it's not, we discard them and if it contain an object, then we also classify which specific uh, class this object belongs to. So that's in terms of the faster region uh, convolutional neural networks. Uh, well, the reason why we uh, chose uh, chosen this architecture because on uh, the TensorFlow object detection API here platform, at the moment when we were conducting experiments, uh, this uh, architecture was uh, the best in terms of the accuracy, and we didn't care too much about uh, the uh, uh, sorry about well, the speed. Uh, so we cared about uh, to detect elephants as uh, accurate as possible. Currently, uh, in an object detection TensorFlow, uh, TensorFlow object detection API here, uh, newly the uh, TensorFlow 2 uh, models do. There are other architectures that are leaning, uh, but at that moment when we were conducting experiments, this, this was the leaning architecture. So, apart uh, from these 11 big uh, satellite imagery, uh, we end up with uh, just uh, 
a little bit less than 200 uh, sub-images, uh, which was uh, 600 by 600 pixels. So the satellite images are miniature, so in order to uh, be able to process them, we uh, slice them into sub-images. And uh, uh, we also had uh, the same uh, resolution in 24 uh, sub-images for test. And the challenge here we had, apart from uh, the background, as uh, Isla mentioned, that we were dealing with the background when elephants can uh, blend uh, with uh, the background, uh, we also were dealing with uh, very small uh, objects. So uh, the full-grown uh, elephants uh, can occupy just 11 pixels uh, in the image. Uh, and uh, if we deal with the 600 by 600 pixels, it's uh, quite a small object. So normally with your object detection, uh, problems, uh, you will have much uh, larger objects. So that was uh, another challenge that we had to deal with. Uh, next slide, please. Thank you. Uh, so a couple of words of uh, TensorFlow Detection API. So since the name of uh, the group, or, or if, uh, or that uh, you may be interested in the technical details uh, here. So yeah, we were just uh, using uh, the off-the-shelf solutions uh, available uh, in uh, this uh, package. As I mentioned, uh, so we were using TensorFlow 1 because uh, at the moment when we were conducting experiments and it was uh, mostly last uh, summer, uh, they hadn't uh, translated it yet uh, to TensorFlow 2. And uh, so in the Zoom for uh, model zoom for TensorFlow 1, uh, as you can see on the image here, uh, we tested uh, two best uh, models. And uh, surprisingly, and uh, for unknown reasons for us. So, so the best model uh, didn't provide us the, the best results. So, so we went uh, or with the second best model from this model zoom, but uh, it provided uh, the best results for our data set. So that was the uh, faster region uh, convolutional neural networks so with the inception ResNet uh, uh, V2 uh, backbone, and it was pre-trained on the Microsoft Coco uh, data set. So we use just default uh, hyperparameters values that is provided with the trained uh, weights. And uh, we just added the vertical flipping as additional data augmentation step, because as you can imagine, so uh, in contrast to the normal images that you're dealing uh, uh, with uh, when you look up, uh, with the upfront uh, images, uh, we can not only uh, horizontally flip the image and uh, stay invariant in terms of the object detection, but uh, we are looking from uh, up front, uh, so we can also vertically uh, flip the image and stay invariant in terms of object detection. We also noticed uh, from the initial experiments, it was not uh, uh, like a proper study, that if we do any image resizing, uh, <clears throat> Sorry, because uh, the first step uh, the, uh, any of this model will do, uh, they will convert the images uh, to the predefined uh, uh, size. And uh, so if we don't uh, slice the image exactly with the uh, image size uh, that is uh, that they would be converted uh, inside of the model, uh, that would harm the performance. And uh, so uh, we just make sure that we slice the image exactly in the size that is required by the model. But there are our preliminary results outside of the TensorFlow Detection API here showed that if we enlarge the images just with the simple interpolation, it helps the performance. So basically, we are making artificially making uh, objects or elephants bigger, and it helps uh, the neural net to detect uh, them. Um, yes, next slide, please. Yes, yeah, so that was uh, our uh, preparation and now for the results. So, so this is an example of uh, what we call homogeneous uh, background. Uh, it's all uniform and uh, uh, e e hopefully you can uh, spot some elephants uh, here. So next slide, please. And this is uh, what uh, the machine uh, was able to detect uh, here. The red rectangles is the ground truth. Uh, so it's labeled uh, created by Eilar and the green uh, uh, bounded boxes is uh, what the machine outputs for us. Next slide, please. Oh, just the previous one, sorry. Oh, 
yeah yeah so this is uh, just uh, a zoom in a version of uh, here so hopefully now you uh, can see the elephants uh, clear and also uh, so how accurately you or we uh, were able to detect them so next slide please uh, yeah, this is an example of for the uh, heterogeneous uh, backgrounds or uh, forested area, and uh, so yeah, this is the zoom out version. So, or, and on the left, uh, this is the input image, and on the uh, right uh, is the detection and the ground truth labels. Next slide, please. Yeah, this is the zoom in version again. So. Uh, hopefully you can uh, see clearly uh, the elephants uh, here and again, so how accurately it can be detected. Uh, you can see so, uh, the false uh, positive examples here and also uh, the false negative, uh, but overall the results uh, were really, really good. So unexpectedly for us, uh, to be honest. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, the overall, uh, so we measured the performance in terms of the F2 score. It's uh, the same as F1 score, uh, which is the uh, geometric mean between the precision and recall. But in F2 score, we punish for the false negatives more. And the reason for that was because uh, for false uh, positive, uh, we can just scan it and ignore uh, the uh, false detection. Whereas if we uh, do have some misdetection, then we need to scan the whole image again and find those uh, uh, missed uh, elephants. So therefore, we decided to use F2 score just to punish uh, the uh, missed uh, detection more. And in terms of the results, uh, as uh, Alan mentioned, so we were comparing with uh, our human uh, our observers. And uh, for, so for the machine, uh, we uh, get the uh, results that were uh, mostly comparable with uh, human performance. Uh, and in terms, of when we look in the heterogeneous areas, so we even outperform a little bit uh, the median results uh, from our human observers. And uh, well, most probably uh, the explanation for that because uh, in our uh, training data set we had more examples from uh, heterogeneous areas uh, whereas uh, for like for human eyes uh, it's uh, obviously much more easier to detect elephants on open space rather than in the forest areas next slide please yeah, this is uh, uh, the uh, same F2 score, but uh, in terms of uh, the uh, per image. So we have, uh, as I mentioned, we had 24 test images, and uh, as you can see, so the results are varied uh, across uh, uh, different images. And uh, we're going to uh, look at just uh, four examples. In two of them, is the uh, example where human outperform the machine, and in two and in two other examples, it's where machine outperform humans. Next slide, please. Yeah, so this is the first example where humans outperform the machine. Uh, so if uh, you can see on the right, uh, so in uh, the uh, red uh, box, so there is a dot. So this is the uh, human uh, detection. And uh, we are, they were uh, missed uh, by the machine. So we can't see any green bounding boxes in that area. Next slide, please. Uh, yeah, this is an interesting example. We put uh, um, in our test images one image uh, that, that didn't contain any elephants. Uh, and uh, so we were uh, thinking that uh, uh, here we can catch uh, some errors from humans, but actually uh, humans were quite reliable in this sense. So they were able to understand that there is no elephants here. Whereas, uh, as you can see, the machine uh, was uh, creating five uh, false positives in this uh, case. Next slide, please. Yeah, and uh, this is uh, the example where machine outperform humans. Uh, and uh, so this uh, this is uh, just on the bottom, uh, there is two uh, tiny elephants uh, which were detected by the machine, but uh, none of the humans uh, uh, were able to detect uh, them. Next slide, please. And this is another example, so where the machine outperform humans uh, again. So uh, I doubt you can see the details here, but uh, it's the uh, complex uh, heterogeneous example, and uh, the machine were able to detect uh, elephants better than the uh, average human here. Next slide, please. 
And uh, finally, so that was all uh, for the uh, other elephant park in South Africa. And we had uh, one test in each uh, in Kenya. The uh, interesting uh, test case here because first of all, it was a different area, not seen by uh, the machine uh, uh, during the training. And uh, also it was from the different satellites. Uh, it was a coarser resolution. So we had the resolution of uh, 31 centimeter for training in South Africa, but for uh, this image, it was 41 centimeter. And uh, we also have uh, some uh, cult presence uh, uh, in uh, these images, uh, whereas uh, for the South Africa, it was all only adult uh, elephants there. And uh, the results were uh, quite good, as you can uh, see in the snapshot uh, here. So we were uh, quite were able quite accurately to detect uh, elephants, uh, and we were ab also able to detect uh, calves, uh, uh, even though uh, the machine has never seen uh, the calves, so only the, the adult elephants. Yeah, so over to you, Ayla, back. Oh, it's again quite noisy from your side. Um, okay, yeah, so the, um, the kind of the main takeaways for the study then is that um, the CNN was able to perform with comparable accuracy to human annotation performance um, and additionally it was able to um, generalize even though all of the training data had been in Addo Elephant Park in South Africa, it, the um, algorithm was still then able to detect elephants in a completely different geographical area um, from coarser resolution imagery um, collected in Kenya. Um, and it was also able to detect calves, which are a, a lot smaller than the, most of the elephants that were in our training data set. Um, so this is the first study um, that's kind of a, a proof of concept that we can now use satellites to detect elephants. Um, and we can detect them in both heterogeneous uh, and homogeneous areas. Um, and we can automate the detection using deep learning with comparable accuracy to human performance. Um, but there's uh, still quite a lot of limitations to being able to do kind of elephant surveying just using satellites, um, and uh, which I highlighted in the first part of the talk. One is um, mainly cost, uh, revisit time, um, and like, tasking capabilities. Um, but these obstacles will um, be mitigated by new satellites coming online. Uh, which are a bigger constellation. So, for example, uh, Maxar have got this Worldview Legion constellation of six satellites that's going to come online um, supposedly toward the end of this year um, with even higher resolution imagery available. So this will be 29 centimetres um, and it will be able to visit the same point on the planet 15 times a day. Um, so that would really scale up the um, kind of availability to be able to monitor different elephant populations um, and cloud cover will become less of an obstacle if you've got uh, multiple re uh, captures. Um, and then also from Airbus, which probably you guys are aware of, we've got the Pleiades Neo constellation, which should be online um, also toward the end of this year, which is four satellites providing imagery at 30 centimeter resolution. Um, and they can revisit the same spot on the planet twice every day. So kind of this uplift in both temporal and spatial resolution of the satellites will mean that we can probably use satellite imaging to monitor more species, especially those that aggregate in large groups and use it, you know, for elephants um, in quite a lot of different sites. For forest elephants, it's not going to be uh, very viable, but um, yeah, there's still a lot of other species that we could test this technique for. Um, but uh, as Olga showed, like the deep learning uh, is is very advanced now and um, is comparable with human detection accuracy and will really be kind of an essential tool to be able to deal with the amount of imagery that's generated from um, from satellite detection uh, work so that there's not studies that have to have multiple eyelids sitting there going through and finding the elephants and drawing the bounding boxes around them. So if we could outsource that to the, to the deep learning um, uh, expertise that would be uh, very helpful to be able to then uh, count you know uh, thousands of elephants in one area in quite a quick period of time um, and really yeah help with wildlife monitoring efforts um, and uplift the, the methods that we're currently using which seem a little bit dated um, so yeah we were really pleased with the results from the study um, and I hope that that was quite comprehensive uh, and that it's also generated some questions from you guys so yeah I hand the floor back to you Tim. 
Thank you so much. That was a fantastic presentation. Thank you guys. Thank you. Yeah. So I'll, I'll open up the floor to anybody who's got any questions. You can throw a hand up or just open your mic. Well, as folks are formulating thoughts, um, yeah, so one of the things, I, I know you just mentioned it sort of in your closing remarks about closed canopy. Um, I'll, I'll go to you in a second, Bipoff, sorry. Uh, um, in working in closed canopy is probably going to be difficult. Um, and I know a lot of the folks on the line primarily work in tropical regions. Um, and I wonder if, if there is any examples you can point us to. And you did a really fantastic job of talking about past examples of of you know identifying penguins and polar bears like those are all new examples to me so thank you so much I'll, I'll i'm going to add to my lit review soon but um anything that you have that's maybe um in your knowledge bank of examples working in the tropics i think folks on the line would be really excited about that because that's primarily where we work Yeah, I, so I haven't seen any studies that have done wildlife monitoring in the tropics using satellites. Um, and I just, yeah, canopy coverage. Wild obese and zebras? Zebra. Sorry, say again, Olga? Uh, the wild obese and zebras from Tijun? Yeah, so that was in Kenya. That was in the Masai Mara. Yeah, that's, I guess, there's quite a lot of vegetation there, but it's quite sparse still. And none of the animals that were detected were below the imagery. So actually we were talking with uh, Chris from Save the Elephants about this, because um, the from aerial census work, they're now looking at the, an, oblique, an oblique image is better than having a vertical uh, image. And so I'm not sure you can, um, when you put a tasking request into the satellites, ask for percentage off an idea. So potentially, if you ask for high percentage of a deer, the image is then going to be a bit distorted in terms of how the animal looks, but that would maybe allow you to look a, kind of under the canopy. Mm. Um, that would be something that would be quite interesting to experiment with. Um, but yeah, you can't see through through the canopy, obviously, so that, that will just always be an option, uh, um, that obstacle, so yeah. Mm. Yeah, thanks so much. Uh, Biplop, do you have a question? Go ahead. Yeah, uh, thanks a lot. This is great presentation. I had a quick question, like you said you did some counting as well. So I was wondering how did you account for any duplication that you might have? Like, for example, you count the same elephant twice or... Um, yeah, so so how we did it was that um, I, the kind of our baseline count was the count that I did. Um, and then Olga double checked all of the labels that I did. Um, so we had a kind of cross reference there. And then we sent the images to 51 volunteers to also label the elephants, then compared that count with the, with the result from the convolutional neural network. So I'm pretty sure that I didn't label any elephants twice because Olga would have seen there's two boxes on one elephant there. Um, there were problems when there was uh, groups of elephant that were very close together. So the boxes would be overlapping, but still because it's, you know, it's going to be say a group of five, there's only five boxes. Both Olga and I agree, okay, there's five elephants there. And then we're comparing the count of from the human annotators and the CNN with that five. Um, so it's possible that there was some double counting, but I, 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 it would have been oversight from both Olga and I in the baseline data set to have done that. Yeah, and also the images uh, were not overlapping and they were from different times. So, so from that kind of point of view, so we shouldn't have any double counting. Okay. Thank you. Yeah, okay, wait, so I think if I've interpreted your question just in one other way, we're not also giving a count for the number of elephants in Addo Elephant Park. So um, that's, there's not, we're not counting, we're not, the 1,125 elephants that made up the training labels, they're from different years, different seasons, and multiple, like those elephants will be the same elephants, no doubt, but it's because it's a proof of concept paper, we're not giving the, um, the population count. 
Gotcha. Yeah. yeah, so that number is just the number of different images. So just yeah. there's samples of images for elephants. Okay, yeah, I was thinking in terms of, for example, you were to, you know, count the number of elephants every year just to see like if the number is increasing or decreasing. But yeah, since this is like a proof of concept, yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah, we, we haven't done this uh, yet. Uh, and uh, yeah, for, for that, uh, we will need to make sure that uh, we are able to cover the whole uh, area, whereas just, it was not possible because some of the areas were uh, dense forested, so we can't uh, see through the trees again, uh, this uh, problem. And we are some of our images, so they were not uh, covering the whole park, uh, so we were able just to see the subsample of the park. So we haven't done uh, this study, as you mentioned. Okay, thank you. Yeah, this would be the, the kind of natural elevation, uh, uh, like second um, round of this uh, study would be to have a ground count an aerial count and a satellite count and then be able to compare the counts and have that do that in a kind of gazetted area so in garamba there's um a fenced area where you've got several thousand elephants and they are planning to do an aerial count there so if we can also task a satellite to capture images of that area and then you've got quite a recent ground population count aerial count satellite count that would then really test whether like how viable is this technique to do a census population count we've kind of just shown okay you can count them from satellite but then using that practically for elephant monitoring, it, there still needs to be more studies done, I think. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Thank you. Great, yeah. Uh, Deepak, over to you. Uh, thank you, Tim. This is uh, amazing, amazing presentation. So, uh, yeah, just a quick question, uh, like how does this model able to differentiate uh, elephant from other animals, like similar to that? Yeah, so we uh, have, so for, for now images, we just had elephants. Uh, so, and um, this is what we are actively trying to uh, do as a future step is uh, to see whether we can uh, detect other elephants and whether we can differentiate elephants from other species. So for example, there is uh, a lot of interest uh, in the wildlife community for, uh, for rhinos. But the problem is that to get uh, imagery for, uh, to test uh, this. Uh, so currently we are in the process of trying to get the imagery of some rhinos and then we can compare whether the model is able to detect rhinos, whether it it can differentiate the elephant from that rhinos. And so, on. so yeah, the obstacle is the imagery. But we are actively looking at okay. Thank you. Great, yeah. Deepak, you're breaking up a little bit. Sorry, I, had, I, I jumped on your mute. <laughs> but that's a great, great point. John, I see you have your hand up. Go ahead. Yeah, hi. Thank you. This was a, a, an amazing presentation. Um, could you talk a little bit more about your exploration? I think there was something where you said where increasing the image size by interpolation improved your result. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Like how, how big did you make it? Like how did you come across that answer? That, I mean, that was pretty interesting. Um, and I can see that being useful for perhaps other things we may try to find. Um, so yeah, any more uh, thoughts or conversation on that, I would appreciate. Okay, yeah, thank you, sure. Uh, it was uh, just the preliminary results based uh, on uh, the uh, work uh, the master student did uh, uh, last year, like in, in parallel when we were finishing this paper, uh, so he was uh, working on uh, uh, this uh, question. So yeah, so the results that you have seen, uh, uh, this is uh, from the off-the-shelf solution. So there is uh, just general faster RCN answer, and we just apply it uh, for the images uh, that we got. Uh, and uh, then, uh, as we mentioned, there are several challenges. So one of them is that uh, the objects are uh, too small. And uh, so we are tested to just the preliminary the results, uh, the ideas how we can improve further the um, 
the accuracy of the model if we account uh, to the fact uh, what we are dealing with. And uh, one of uh, the idea was, uh, so can we just enlarge artificially elephant size uh, and then uh, so the model can maybe or we'll be able to get uh, elephants better. And uh, so that's what the master student uh, uh, did. Uh, so uh, he used uh, several methods uh, uh, to do so. So I think uh, the largest that uh, he's improved the images is, was uh, twofold. Uh, the image uh, and uh, yeah, the simplest model was just um, linear interpolation. And uh, uh, the, uh, the other one, he was using some pre-trained uh, guns uh, to enlarge the images uh, I'm not on the top of my head to remember the details about that but uh, it was uh, pre-trained on some uh, satellite imagery so apparently the maybe they down sample it uh, to create the training data set but uh, uh, so they were able to collect the uh, data set where you have uh, the satellite imagery of different resolutions and uh, so you trained the gun to uh, to output the uh, images of higher resolution and then uh, so this is what the student applied to our images and the results were uh, promising but uh, so yeah that's just the preliminary results so we haven't finalized it uh, yet but it seems uh, that uh, this idea of uh, enlarging the smaller objects into the bigger object artificially it may help uh, the object detection unit yeah thank you yeah, yeah that's fascinating um be interested to hear more about that if there and yeah. when there's a publication <laughs> yeah <laughs> thank you Thanks. Any other questions on the line? Well, I've got one. So um, with the, I, I, I really love that you sort of wrapped up the presentation talking about new satellites coming online and where you, you guys plan to go with a lot of this research. And something that we have a lot of availability is planet data. And I know that probably doesn't fit exactly for the resolution that you, you guys are looking at right now, but there is there just seems to be so much planet imagery available right now. And do you see there's any ability to use that for some of your methods as of right now, or does that just not fit with you know your needs for resolution? Um, I think it would be excellent if we could use it and possibly it could be used for some species that aggregate in very large groups. So you could probably see like the wildebeest aggregations in the Serengeti, for example. Um, but whether you could actually get a good count is another problem. So I'm doing another study, which is part of my PhD, which is looking at um, like GPS elephant movement in relation to where you've got pastoral livestock enclosures. And for that, we're using the Worldview 2 imagery, mm -hmm. which is 50 centimeters. And even in that, uh, like, um, much coarser resolution from 31 centimeters to 50 centimeters, we can't see any elephants. Oh, wow. Um, so I think it's actually quite uh, quite limited what we would be able to do with like upward of a meter. I can't, what's the the highest resolution from planet at the moment is like... I think it's three, but someone else on the line could correct me. I think it's three meters. Yeah, so you could do like maybe some of the studies that I showed at the beginning where you're looking at um, like proxies, so mounds or burrows. You could look at like, there's been some studies looking at wombat presence from where the, the burrows are, maybe the three meters could be used. Also, you can look at, you know, presence of elephants because they've knocked down a lot of trees. Mm -hmm. um, so using some kind of environmental proxy would probably be possible and maybe for species that aggregate in really large groups, but you wouldn't get an individual count. But I think we're, we're pretty limited just by the spatial resolution at this point. Um, but yeah, the, the new constellation from Worldview and Airbus will be phenomenally, um, fantastic in terms of what we can do it's just that the cost is still really high um and they unfortunately closed the foundation down so i got all of this imagery from my phd from the digital globe foundation before they came became maxar um, and they're no longer giving out any imagery for free mm -hmm. um so what what it, what we also benefited from is the european space agency have a grant um that they give to researchers whether they then pay for third party imagery so they like paid maxar to put this tasking through um, in Mali, um, so that that was that's cool. But they have quite a small budget, and you have to go through like a big form to be able to get just one image from them. Yeah, so the 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 resolution and the cost is still the big limitations. But 
yeah try stuff with planet if if you have loads of access it would be quite fun to see um what what you could detect um if i if i can have a if i think a little bit more about it maybe some other species would come a uh, whale sharks could be good in mexico maybe be able to see them big aggregations of huge huge whales sharks yeah yeah, yeah just to add a note oh, yeah, sorry. Uh, yeah, that uh, on the separate work uh, I'm involved, uh, we are dealing with uh, damage detection after the natural disasters. And uh, some of the imagery is coming from uh, planet, some from uh, Mars. Even for the buildings, uh, the planet is much, much more challenging uh, mm -hmm. to deal with. Uh, yes, yeah, so probably for animals, uh, it would be even more challenging. Yeah, I know. I know there's been been a really big initiative with uh, the NICFI data that's now available with the planet imagery. Um, so a lot of folks in Severe are, are leveraging that, but we're sort of thinking outside the box of what what else you can do with it beyond you know disaster response, for instance. That's something that is a, a main example. And I know a lot of folks online have been using it to do validation sets for like deforestation. And that's the next thing I was going to just mention is that. Um, you, you briefly mentioned that you have a, a system to create your, or to do your sampling, and I think it, uh, you, met, you, you showed it in a link in the slides. Um, and we have something similar, but probably, <laughs> probably not the same. We use a system called Collector of Online to, do, to pull in uh, high resolution imagery and do sampling. Um, and you know, I'll be sure to share that along, but maybe there's um, an opportunity for you guys to to see that, and um, I would definitely be interested in hearing more about um, your your system to create those those samples. Um, and I think that's uh, if you've got any insight on that. Well, the uh, the tool that we it's it's freely available. So and it was created by the Computer Vision Group uh, at Oxford, uh, mm -hmm. and it's uh, it's open sourced and it's really lightweight. So it's basically the HTML page uh, and but the all functionality is there so but it's just for the annotation of the images uh, yeah you'll feel, feel free to uh, to check it out yeah so uh we firstly so we are uh, when we started the project so uh it was label image that uh, we came across mm -hmm. as a tool mm -hmm. um so Eiler uh, was working with that uh, and then uh, when we decided to to uh, also have this uh, human volunteers so it was obviously that we can't share this uh, label image tool because you need to install it uh, from source files. Uh, so nobody will going to do that. Uh, so uh, we had a look around again uh, for the annotation tools, and we found, uh, yeah, the home existed uh, at Oxford, uh, and uh, yeah, uh, it, it's doing its job, and it's really uh, lightweight. It's open source. Uh, yes, a fantastic tool for its purposes. Great, yeah, thanks so much. Um, I don't want to hog the mic if anyone else has any more questions. We have three minutes left, so. Well, I could, I could literally uh, chat about this forever. I, one thing I wanted to mention, I know that we've talked a, a little bit in our group about like the YOLO model, and I wonder if that's something that you guys had tried. Um, I saw your long list of different models and you know relative performance, but I was wondering you know, if this is maybe a perfect um, example of using something like uh, YOLO, and I, I wonder if um, you've got any insight in, in leveraging that. So we are, the first model that we tried, it was not YOLO, but SSD. Uh, so if you have this, the same type of architecture, uh, it just because uh, yeah, uh, for the uh, purpose of testing it, quickly testing, so that was providing the good results. Uh, but uh, so as I mentioned, so we were uh, aiming for the accuracy, uh, therefore, so, based on uh, the uh, TensorFlow model zoo. Uh, so the, the first person then give, gives you much higher accuracy than YOLO, so we were just focusing on that. But uh, the, uh, again, so, so the master students uh, that were playing around with the data, they tried YOLO, mm -hmm. but again, the first person then provides much more accurate results. And because we don't care too much about the time, at least at at this point, although this proof of concept, uh, yeah, so we are focusing on fast Well, great. Yeah, I'm, I'm definitely going to look into that now. That's 